For over two decades, American soldiers fought on the battlefields of Vietnam, and it came with an extraordinary cost of human life. Nearly 60,000 soldiers died during the war. For the ones that survived, little did they know they were also fighting the unstoppable spread of an invisible enemy. An enemy that would grow in strength and through the decades, go on to kill more Americans than the entire 21-year conflict by a factor of five. Inside the human body, the hepatitis C virus acts with unusual stealth. Infected individuals may feel fine for years and even decades. And then without warning, hepatitis C can awaken and cause irreversible cirrhosis, liver failure, and death. Years before its discovery in 1989, hepatitis C, a blood-borne virus, was rapidly spread in Vietnam through blood transfusion, immunizations, and unprotected battlefield surgery. You have a highly contagious disease like this, which has no vaccine and has no cure. Where is the public health campaign and public health outcry about this disease? Vietnam played a large role in the spread of this disease in the United States, and it gave hepatitis C a head start on medical intervention. As of today, Hepatitis C now kills more Americans than 60 other infectious diseases combined, including tuberculosis and HIV AIDS. Let me just say, I, I, I don't feel there's a sense of urgency here. You know, I, I hate to say that, and that really bothers me, because we're talking about a life and death issue. There was just a lot of anguish and, um, and I didn't have any control over it. And that made it really hard because it was like, well, what can you do now? What can you do now? You can't do anything now. There's nothing to help you. In the years that followed the discovery of hepatitis C, medical treatments were only able to reach a level of moderate success. You know, I was just so scared for my daughter because, you know, if something would have happened to me and I died, <sighs> She wouldn't have me to be there for her. And I wanted, I wanted her to be happy and to meet a man to love her and support her, go to her wedding, see my grandchildren, things that I thought about a lot. The only drugs available on the market at the time not only had poor results, but also had devastating side effects. I personally went through the treatment 10 years ago, which beats you up inside. My hair fell off in clumps, and um, I lost my thyroid hormone, so now I'm on that medication. And they put me on the traditional interferon and ribavirin, which was the go-to, and it made me so sick the doctors got scared. I mean, it just flattened me. And I said, you know something? I will die of this before I ever go back on those medicines again. Luckily, in 2007, medical research was presented that would forever change the landscape of hepatitis C treatment. There is a new cure on the rise. There is a new drug on the market that will help cure hepatitis C. The drug has been called a miracle drug. It actually cures hepatitis C. Wait a minute, so this, this is a Definite cure for, a hepatitis cure for hepatitis C? No kidding. Yeah. I mean, no that's kidding. amazing, right? Sofosfavir. Sofosfavir was, was designed by a chemist called Mike Sophia. We did the original human studies of that drug. I presented the data at the Berlin liver meeting, and it was the first time anybody had seen a 100% cure rate in the treatment of hepatitis C. And I remember the meeting because the audience was in stunned silence. This was perhaps the only time I've ever sat in a, in a medical conference where everybody went, oh. They couldn't believe it. For the first time, tablets had cured hepatitis C. We're not talking about a drug with marginal benefits. We're talking about a drug that's a game changer for people's lives. By 2014, we had combined drugs and done the clinical trials and presented the data that resulted in a treatment for hepatitis C that could cure 95% of patients with one tablet once a day that was simple, safe, and effective. 
All of a sudden it changes to, we have a med that works in three months. The side effects are minimal to none. You'll feel better in a month. It's there. And let's get everybody tested. Let's get everybody cured. You really could eliminate hepatitis C completely. There'd be no transmission of hepatitis C if everybody started on it immediately. I mean, this is a virus that could be cleared. We could clear it from the planet, but we can't because it's too expensive. The thousand dollar a day pill. That's a lot of money for a single tablet. In fact, that makes one tablet of sofosbuvir, as it's called, the most expensive substance on Earth. Now let's turn to the rising price of prescription drugs and outcries to do something about it. An investigation into the cost of prescription drugs reveals huge price hikes over the past five years. Several brand name medications more than doubled in price. This is an industry-wide problem of price gouging, of demanding as much as can be obtained out of sick and dying Americans. The US medical community is outraged after a life-saving drug soared a more than 5,000% price hike. The truth is that there is not a person out there practically who could afford to pay for these medications. I mean, you'd have to be, you know, uh, a millionaire to, to be able to do that. 70% of Americans take at least one prescription drug. Researchers say a record 4 billion prescriptions were written in 2011. It was very clear to me I had entered into an industry unlike any before. It truly was all about the sale. Is this a fair profit? I don't know. Because this seems like significantly higher. Do they deserve a 20-fold return on their investment? A hundred-fold? It's the number we're plucking out of the air. Both leading Democratic presidential contenders are proposing federal rules regulating how prescription drugs are priced. Well, the simple truth is they can do anything they want at any time they want to do it. Who raised prices? By how much? I mean, who are the biggest offenders here? Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hostage situation. The drug company is saying, if you don't give us the price we want, the hostage dies. Why is this happening? There is no system in place to hold down drug prices, and so companies are just becoming increasingly bold. There's something wrong. The system is broken. When there is a cure available, it ought to be available, not just available to the highest bidder. Industry-wide price increases have risen to the forefront of political debate, and California, home to some of the nation's largest pharmaceutical companies, finds itself at the epicenter of that discussion. We have seen drug prices uh, over the decades uh, climb and climb and climb, but in recent years, we've seen them skyrocket uh, to incredibly challenging levels for all Americans. Uh, prices that no one ever expected for drugs that had been priced much lower, uh, but have seen their prices jacked up uh, enormously. And when you're talking about millions of Californians who suffer from hepatitis, have cancer, uh, need insulin, uh, have HIV or AIDS, and are seeing their drug prices go not only well beyond what they can pay for, but well beyond what their employer and government can also help pay for, uh, we have a crisis on our hands. Tonight, the head of a drug company who's accused of gouging patients says he should be thanked. In one instance, he raised the price of a drug used by AIDS patients from $13.5 a pill to $750. The FDA has no authority over drug prices. In February, Valiant Pharmaceuticals raised prices for two newly purchased heart drugs, Isoprel and Nitropress, 212 and 525 percent. Uh, Mr. President, I rise to discuss one of the major crises facing our health care system today, and that is that the pharmaceutical industry itself has become a major health hazard to the American people. The United States makes up less than 5% of the world's population. Yet Americans purchase over 50% of the world's pharmaceutical drugs. Prices are going up outrageously, no justification. So you can walk into a drugstore tomorrow and find that the price that you're paying for the same medicine you've had for 20 years has been doubled. And you ask the pharmacist why. There's no reason. They can double it based on market needs. So what you have is an incredibly powerful industry 
charging any price they want. And the result of that is that one out of five Americans can't afford the medicine that they need. Can you imagine that? So they go to the doctor, doctor writes a prescription, but they can't afford to fill it. But five major companies made $50 billion in profits last year. So you have an insane situation in which people are dying because they can't afford the medicine they need or getting much sicker than they should just so these companies can make outrageous profits. Yeah, about three months ago, I went to see if I can get my insulin. I went to the pharmacist and uh, they told me I had to pay a copay of $360 for one of them. I can't afford these medications. I can't afford hardly to live. You know, when I realized that I couldn't get the medication, it was scary. You know, it's, it's so unpredictable what this disease can do to you. So my mother had diabetes and she had high blood pressure. I was telling, she, when she was 28 years old, she had a major, major stroke and she was paralyzed from head to toe all her life. You know, so I grew up going to hospitals, nursing homes, and I see my mother didn't have a life or nothing. Yeah, I, can you hold a second? Yeah. And I don't want that to happen to me. Uh, I, I, what she went through, what diabetes could put you through. I even tried uh, going to the emergency because my sugar was so high. And then when your sugar's that high, the doctor see you and he'll give you some insulin. But the vial that they gave you the medicine from, they throw it away. Rather than give it to me, you know what I'm saying? It's rather than just give it to me because I don't have any, they won't. You know, it's, it's like a business, you know, it's no concern, you know? You know, working with pharmaceutical companies is tricky because they're in it to make money and the profits are huge, the stakes are huge. The pharmaceutical industry is one of the most profitable industries in the United States. In fact, in 2015, pharmaceutical revenue topped the charts, besting oil, tobacco, transportation, and banking. What I've learned in 27 years in dealing with these folks is that we can work with the pharmaceutical industry as long as we remember to keep patients in the center of the equation. And I always tell them that as long as we do that, and remember to do that, we won't make a mistake. It's when we move patient well-being and interest off to the side and let profit sneak in as the primary goal, that's when things go amiss. As Dr. Marsha Angel, a senior lecturer in social medicine at Harvard Medical School and a former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, recently wrote in the Washington Post, and I quote, why do drug companies charge so much? because they can, end of quote. In fact, the total spending on medicine in the United States has gone up by 90% since 2002. A diagnosis of a serious disease is also a diagnosis of bankruptcy or financial ruin. Even people with good insurance are finding they cannot afford essential life and death prescription drugs. I've always felt that the, the, the philosophy for pricing uh, medications by pharmaceutical companies is what can we get away with? There are so many examples of government, uh, mostly the federal government, spending tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in drugs that then uh, get used by private companies to go through the final development of drug approval. Uh, with companies that then get acquired by other companies, with CEOs that then jack up the prices. Uh, I can give an example, the EpiPen. My son's name is Shane, and on a regular basis, Shane has to have medications for his asthma, which include the maintenance medication, as well as his rescue inhaler. And he also has to have his EpiPen, his epinephrine, because of his life-threatening food allergies. 
The drug and device combo now known as the EpiPen was on the market for 20 years before it was purchased by Mylan Pharmaceuticals in 2007. But the cost of the EpiPen is surging, putting the pinch on many families. The auto injector's price has risen by more than 480 percent since 2009. With little competition, that gives them freedom to raise the price every year. If we use what we currently have, because this is a single-use medication, and um, if I, we use that medication and I have to go buy more, I'll be honest, I don't know what I would do. For it to be, at this point, $600 and who knows what else it's going to go up to, that's incredible. I mean, it's the same thing with the other maintenance medications they have. It's too much money and it shouldn't cost that much, especially when you know the medicine itself really is not that expensive. The actual cost of the drug inside the EpiPen is only a couple of bucks, so the manufacturer is essentially charging hundreds of dollars for a case and a trusted name. Such a steep increase in a product that has been readily available for over two decades has called into question the true motivation of Mylan Pharmaceuticals and its CEO, Heather Bresch. While the drug price has been increased by 500%, we saw the CEO make $19 million off of this decision. Understand you earned 2.5 less than 10 years ago to 18 million last year. That's, that's the figure. I am blessed and fortunate to have not only financially, but to have worked with this company for 25 years and to- Could I ask you this? Uh, what have you doses. done to earn a 671% increase? What have you done to earn that kind of increase? Well. I believe Mylan has done a tremendous amount, starting no, with I'm saving. I'm asking what you have done. I'm interested in your compensation. What have you done to well, earn that with, kind of an increase, 671% increase in less than 10 years? I'm tired of people treating us like we're just parents who don't know any better. I know better. I know simple math. And simple math tells me that the cost that the pharmaceutical industry is charging families for medications is completely unnecessary. And may, they might have started out wanting to do some good stuff, but greed has taken over and the greed is making it so that my kids can't even have a regular life. This story, the EpiPen, we're hearing a story like this every single month. A pharma CEO led out of his office in handcuffs for fraud. Uh, Martin Screlly had managed to increase the price of a drug that was critical for HIV and AIDS patients 5,000%. A drug that used to cost $1 that he then priced to over $750 per medication. You know, in response to all of this attention and doctors and patient groups saying they can't access this drug, are you going to change the price? No. If you could rewind the clock a few months, I wonder if you would do anything differently. I probably would have raised the price higher. Is, is probably what I would have done. Um, um, Why? I, I think healthcare prices are inelastic. I could have raised it higher and made more profits for our shareholders. People's lives are at stake because of the price increases you impose and the access, the access problems that have been created. You've been viewed as a so-called bad boy of pharma. Are you listening? Yes. The way I see it, you can go down in history as the poster boy for greedy drug company executives, or you can change the system. We are continually told by the pharmaceutical industry that their prices are high because they have to pay for the research and development. The problem with that proposition is we don't know what companies are spending on research and development, but we have seen studies that show that many companies are spending 19 times as much money on the marketing and advertising part than they are on the research and development part. Did you know that we are the only developed nation in the world where it's legal to market drugs to the, directly to the drugs. consumer? Yep. Yes. Because it's immoral. If they spend 18 times as much or nine times as much, or two times as much, we could probably get these drug prices reduced dramatically. But we just don't know what these companies are spending. There's no transparency. Uh, drug companies will never reveal how they came up with what they're going to charge for a medication. So when they make claims that it's associated with the cost of research and development, there's no way to really check that out. I think a great example is this uh, hepatitis C medication called Harvoni, which is made by Gilead, which is an incredible medication. 
Whatever else you want to say about Gilead, they have brought a wonderful drug to the marketplace. They didn't develop it, they bought it, but they've brought it all the way along. On the flip side, it would be my opinion, having worked with them closely, that there's no company out there that is more ethically challenged than Gilead. Gilead priced this medication at $1,000 a pill, and there is just no justification for that. The primary active ingredient in Harvoni is sofosbuvir, the game-changing hepatitis C drug. Sofosbuvir was discovered under the leadership of a company called Pharmacet. The actual research, however, was done by the Department of Veterans Affairs, funded by taxpayer dollars. So in 2012, Gilead Sciences purchased a pharmaceutical company called Pharmacet, and this was very much in the news that year, especially on Wall Street, for $11.2 billion. People wondered at the time whether it was a good deal or a bad deal. Gilead Sciences is set to acquire biotech Pharmacet and its hepatitis C compounds for nearly $11 billion, marking Gilead's largest deal to date. Where is the discipline? Because this is a staggering overpay in my book. It was a great deal. Uh, as it turns out. They recoup that money in under a year. That's unheard of. The cost of that drug is less than a dollar a day, and that includes the plastic bottle that comes in. And, and the price to the consumer is $1,000 a day. So I don't know, is that a reasonable profit margin? It is outrageous that as taxpayers, we paid for the tens of millions of dollars of research and development to develop these hepatitis drugs, but with $1,000 per pill pricing, for $100,000 per treatment pricing, Gilead has been able to make $13 billion a year. That's outrageous. The Gilead executives priced this not to recoup their past costs because they didn't have any costs on research and development, but to maximize their profits off the backs of patients who are dying. You know, there was, um, there's a famous quote by a, a, a Supreme Court justice that when the Supreme Court had a pornography case, uh, brought before it and, and he said something to the effect of, I don't know if I can define pornography, but I know it when I see it. And I feel the same about greed. I mean, you know it when you see it and we see it all the time now. Well, you know, before we dis discuss whether a particular company is pr charging too much or, or making too much, let's remember that they're just playing the game that they're handed. So if a company uh, charges a lot of money, um, they're basically just doing what the system is inviting them to do anyway. It's basically capitalism. Uh, so is there, are there other areas of the economy where we tell people you can't make that much? We have invited them to uh, innovate these new therapies and then gouge the system, but it is the system that they were handed to work with. The system needs to change. Our current drug development platform, once built to incentivize medical innovation, is now under fire for being a protective barrier for unjustified pharmaceutical pricing. The challenge is, under law, we provide drug manufacturers with a monopoly if they are fortunate enough to come up with a new treatment. And that monopoly gives them monopoly protection for uh, 10, 15, 17 years uh, to be able to price a drug however they want. You know, there's a lot of developed countries that have excellent health care where there are um, panels and committees that are, are designated to set pricing for drugs. You know, only in this country do we not do that. We just basically let the drug companies set whatever price they want and then we're forced to pay for it. There's this theory that you can regulate the monopolies in the public interest. The problem is the monopoly has all this money they get from being a monopolist, and they use that to corrupt the system. They use that to influence the system. It's been a failure to, mono to, to regulate the, the, these drug monopolies. That's why some people want actually a much more radical approach, because it's not like we're regulating the monopolies. It's like the monopolies are regulating us. Many of the drugs that we're talking about, you can go to other countries and get them for far cheaper. So let's take the hepatitis drugs. It's cheaper to fly Californians to other countries to get them treated than to actually treat them in California. If we flew them to Great Britain, these pills cost a third less. If we fly them to India or Egypt, it costs 1% of the cost of what it costs here in California. 
With little to no transparency or leverage, most public and government groups find themselves defenseless against soaring drug rates. The pharmaceutical industry is so powerful in this country that with very few exceptions, the VA being one, there are no negotiations. So the drug companies can charge any price they want. The time is long overdue for the American people to stand up to the greed of the pharmaceutical industry. We should be doing it here in Washington, but they own Washington, unfortunately. They have spent since 1998 over $3 billion in lobbying. $3 billion in lobbying, not to mention enormous amounts of money and campaign contributions. Not only are they the top lobbying industry, but they outspend every other American industry by at least 44%. This gives them unparalleled lobbying power. The pharmaceutical industry has prevailed for almost a decade here in Washington in just wiping this issue off the agenda. There's no discussion, there are no votes since 2007. The pharmaceutical industry has a grip around this capital that is very firm. There's no real restraint from Washington on pharmaceutical price gouging. That's why California leadership is once again so very important to this entire country. With Congress at a standstill, California aims to pass legislation at the state level. Proposition 61 is actually quite simple in the way it is conceived. At the federal level, the Department of Veterans Affairs has the lowest drug prices of any federal agency, lower than Medicaid, lower than Medicare. If California can pass Proposition 61, which says that uh, state agencies will not have to pay more than the VA does. Number one, it will substantially lower the cost of drugs for those agencies, saving taxpayers money. Second of all, it will expose the fraud that is the pricing mechanism of the pharmaceutical industry. California voters need to wake up. This is why they need to, to step forward and say, we want some accountability, we want some fairness in our drug prices. I really think that this problem, if, if we don't do something about it now to stop it, is just going to get worse. Well, California Nurses Association supports Prop 61 because it's a first step in beginning to control costs of medications in California. ARP believes that people of all ages should have access to affordable prescription drugs. Uh, the only way the prices come down is with, as we've seen with the VA, when there's a, they can represent a huge consumer group and then force those prices to come down because they're buying so much. And that's why Prop 61 needs to pass in California. It is the only way the system is going to change, short of rewriting the rules of capitalism. If the largest state in this country, the progressive state of California, can stand up and take on the pharmaceutical industry, it will be great for the taxpayers of California, and it will be a real blow against this greedy industry that will reverberate all over America.